This video addresses abortion from the standpoint of the American pragmatist philosopher William James's concept of live choices versus dead choices. Live choices are choices that are weighty or momentous. Dead choices are ones that are kind of theoretical. You're trying to decide something that really doesn't have that much importance to you. I do want to say that when we're addressing abortion, we're dealing in terms of live choices. So in the picture here, you see Katuna Lorig and her son. Katuna is the lady who trained uh, Jennifer Lawrence to play the part of Katniss in the Hunger Games. In 1992, she won the bronze medal in the Olympics while she was carrying her son, four months pregnant with carrying her son. Just recently, we've had uh, the, a young lady at eight months pregnant won the gold medal in the Olympics in archery. And so the point being why I raise this is pregnancy is not as restrictive as sometimes people portray it as being. My wife, uh, we just, that we're celebrating right now actually our anniversary of 43 years. Uh, my wife and I went out to Wyoming, drove all the way out there with her seven months pregnant from New York State, and we went and rode horseback across the Grand Teton Mountains in Wyoming, just outside of Jackson Hole, and she had no difficulty doing that. So it, it's, it's interesting. By the way, too, my students oftentimes think that they mean there's no sex with regard to pregnancy. Well, that's not true. Unless there's some sort of a problem with the pregnancy, pretty much right up until the time of birth, it's okay for one to be intimate, to be sexually intimate with a sexual partner. Um, so it's, it's not as restrictive as sometimes you hear it portrayed as being. Okay, let's get into the topic at hand. William James and the idea of live choices versus dead choices. So he says, live choices are choices in our lives that are accomplishable and they're of great interest to the individual. So how to know if it's a live issue or a, a live choice when you're dealing with a question? And this is the question we ask, is the option before me, is it momentous? Is it weighty? Is it significant? If a choice is easily undone, if you could just choose to un undo what it is that you do, or it has little effect, then it cannot be said to be momentous. If it is a unique choice and has a great effect, then it is momentous. And as you'll see, this is about a choice that was quite momentous. Here's one of the most live choices, one of the most momentous decisions anyone can ever make. The question of to keep or not to keep the human being who is developing in utero after conception takes place. So I want to speak to you about Jean Ann Kayser. Jean Ann was the child of Naomi Foreman. In 1937 in Kingston, New York, a 19-year-old young woman named Naomi Foreman became pregnant with her fiancé's child. He told her he would not marry her unless she got an abortion, and she refused. Now, you live in the 21st century in a time when if a pregnant young lady walks across the stage to receive her diploma from high school, everybody applauds. But she would vanish back then if she was pregnant. She wouldn't finish school, and nobody was going to applaud. There was a lot of shame associated with pregnancy out of wedlock back in that time. And so this man, by the last name of Van Alstein, he did not want to have the shame of people knowing that they had been intimate prior to their marriage. He told her he would not marry her unless she got an abortion, and she refused. Her par parents told her to get an abortion. By the way, her, her fiancé and her parents know, knew exactly which doctor to go to in Kingston, New York at that time in order to have an abortion. Were they legal? No. Were they able to be had and safely? Yes. And there's often times uh, across time that there has been, when something is illegal, you can still get it done medically. Uh, not to say that there haven't been unsafe uh, abortions, that's not the point, but to say that across time in much of the United States, it has been possible for one to get an abortion even before Roe v. Wade back in 1973. So her parents told her to get an abortion and she refused again. So. They sent her out to live with family in Ohio to, to have no, people not be able to see as she got the, her baby bump. So she was out there. She wasn't treated particularly well while she's out there. She had the baby. Then after a couple of months, she returned home bringing her baby with her. Now, it needs to be said, back in that time, there was no welfare. There was no aid for dependent children or food stamps or even WIC back then. Naomi didn't have a choice. She had to go home and live with her parents. She had been expecting in the economy of the 1930s that her fiancé was going to support them when they got married and she would be a homemaker. That's how life was back then. So she was a little bit 
unable to figure out how she would live on her own and support a child. She didn't have the social programs to make that possible today. So her parents took the child and they raised it as their own, not allowing Naomi to raise it. They encouraged her, the eldest, to move out of the home and the baby was raised with its aunts and uncle, it should be just one uncle, as its siblings. The little girl, Jean, was eventually made aware that she was the biological child of her eldest sister, Naomi. And Jean grew up thinking, because nobody told her otherwise, that Naomi had not wanted her. And so she resented Naomi quite a bit. She thought, why didn't she want me? She then ultimately would have half-brothers and sisters who were the children of Naomi, and she treated them as her siblings, as well as her uncle and her aunts. But she did not treat Naomi like she was her mother at all. Her grandmother was the one who she thought of as being her mother. When Naomi was dying, Jean, now a grown woman in her 40s, went to see her in order to try to forgive her before she died. And here's what happened. When she went to see her, Naomi told a different story, a story that made Jean furious. She stormed out of the hospital in anger at Naomi because Naomi said that her parents had wanted her to have her, the, the, the people who she grew up with, really her grandparents, uh, but whom she thought of as her parents, that they had wanted Naomi to have an abortion. And so she didn't believe that. She called her sisters, because her brother, her uncle, really her uncle, had died by then, so it's just her sisters, her aunts, and asked about what Naomi had said. She asked them, did Naomi want to keep me, and did mom and dad try to get her to abort me, and then force her to give me up to them to raise as their own? And her sisters all told her, yes, your mom... Naomi, your biological mom, is telling you the truth. Only Naomi wanted you. Everyone else, her fiancé, Van Alstyne, and mom and dad wanted you aborted because of the shame associated with pregnancy out of wedlock. So in William James' terms, this was very much a live choice. Its outworkings were momentous. What do I mean by that? Well, that's the little girl who was born, who was born out of wedlock, Jean Anne, and she was in that day, Jean Ann Barba, because really um, her, her grandparents were really only her biological grandmother and then her husband or her, her husband that had been biologically, Jean's uh, grandfather, had died, so she remarried. So she uh, grew up with her grandparents, Jean did, and she was Jean Ann Barba. This is Jean Ann when she married Dick Kayser. Um, and this, this is um, in the 1950s that these two got married. And this is their daughter, their daughter back in the 1970s with her four children. I'm married to their daughter, to Deb Kayser. She's Debbie Jean Kayser, or Deborah Jean Kayser. Uh, in the background, you can see our eldest, and off to the left, then our second child, and to the right, our third child, and in the foreground in Deb's arms, you can see our youngest child, who's now 36 years old, a little girl. So I do, before we move on from this picture, I want to say, remember the little guy with curly hair, because he's important. He's going to come into the story a little bit later on. Okay, so those are our children. Each of them is married. They all have children. Three years ago, this was our grandchildren in the backyard of our home, sitting around eating watermelon, as you can see. So that's three years ago. There's 11 grandchildren there. At this point in time, there are 13 grandchildren. This is the 13 grandchildren out back of our house in the stream that runs behind, or the river that runs behind our house. It's a very low level, you can see, because it's a hot summer and not a lot of rain. And this is them standing on the hill behind our house. There's a 14th one on the way, uh, just to make mention of that as I, as I pass. So the point is, is that this is a live choice. The decision made by that 19-year-old girl in 1937, not a one of those lives that you just saw, Jean Ann, the little girl who grew up to be my mother-in-law, or my wife, or our children, or our grandchildren would exist if that 19-year-old hadn't stood up for the life of the child that she was carrying in within, and then suffered from her fiancé and from her parents the humiliation and the rejection that she did back in 1938. And that's the point, that this is a weighty decision. All of those lives were tied to that one life. None of those lives you saw there would exist had it been that Naomi gave in and had the abortion that she was being pushed to have. So live choice number two, remember I, I mentioned to you to 
uh, remember the curly-haired guy on the left. So his name is Joshua. He's our second child. And he and his wife, became April, became pregnant with a little child while my mother-in-law was still alive. Jean Ann Kayser no longer is alive. She died of breast cancer about eight years ago now. But they got pregnant with a little girl, and they named her Gloria Jean for her great-grandmother, for in, in um, honor of Jean Ann Kayser. And they, when they were dealing with the pregnancy, they discovered that it was not coming along normally. So this is looking down at the skull of the baby that was developing in utero, Gloria Jean Johnson. And you can see that there's a lot of brain matter missing on the right-hand side of the skull, of this picture of the skull. So not as much brain matter as we would desire for there to be, and you can even see there's a little bit missing on the left as well in this picture. What Joshua and April were told about their baby once the doctors could see this, by the way, the radiologist, most likely, who did the evaluation of the images that they got is a friend of mine by the name of Mary, who is a radiologist and also a professor who teaches down in the Boston area, lives up here in the Bangor area, and she's pretty sure that she's the one who would have said that they should terminate this pregnancy. So they were told the baby will never be able to swallow, see, walk, talk, or live on her own. Likely she will live and die in the newborn intensive care unit at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Now I, because of the other part of my life, besides being a college professor, I have been with, walked with two families through the process of their baby never coming home from the NICU. And one lived for over a year and lived and died in the NICU. And another one lived for almost a year and then died in the NICU. So I knew what this was like. And I, I personally did not want to see our son and daughter-in-law go through the heartache of having their baby never come home from the hospital. However, when Gloria Jean was born, she didn't even go into the NICU or even into any kind of a special um, facility at all. She had a private room. She was a smiling, happy baby, and everything seemed to be normal. She was able to swallow. She was able to see. Eventually, she would talk quite a bit and walk on her own, although she has difficulties with her walking. And um, she would be uh, ultimately somebody with this crazy, funny sense of humor. But that, that remains for a little while before we would discover sense of humor that this child had. Her parents, Josh and April, decided they would have the child against medical advice. This is her not when she's a newborn, but at about five months, and she's hooked up to EEGs. They're, they're doing electroencephalographs, and they're trying to chart what's going on with her brain waves because due to the lack of brain matter on the one side of the brain, she was having seizures, grand mal and petit mal seizures, although they tend not to use that terminology anymore. So one of the things that drives the advice given to young couples that they should have an abortion if they think that the child is Down syndrome or if they think the child is going to have some sort of a um, congenital defect is the fear of a wrongful life lawsuit. In this highly litigious society in which we live, people can actually sue for having had a baby who's not perfect and be awarded lots of money. That's another story for another day. This is little Gloria at her preschool with her mommy in Stratham, New Hampshire. This is her for her sixth birthday at the Waterville Boys and Girls Club here in Maine with her daddy, with Josh lifting her up out of the water. She loves the water. This is her in first grade. She's in the polka dotted sweater, the blue and white polka dotted sweater in the foreground. And that's her with her first grade celebrating her birthday. So you can see that not everything is completely normal. You can see the right foot in this cast and then the brace. And you can see, if you look closely at her right hand, that it's the fingers are like tight. They're clenched. That's not just an accident of how she has her hand down. They're clenched. They have to give her periodically Botox shots in the muscles of her right side in order to get things to relax. Otherwise, they're all tightened up due to the, the brain and the, the situation with the brain. And with her, periodically, they work the right side the way you would take in, in, in a similar fashion to you, the way you deal with lazy eye with a child where you cover the good eye and make, force them to use the lazy eye. And so they do similar sorts of things with the right side of her body. She receives hippotherapy where she gets to ride on horses to get her to feel the feeling in her pelvis of walking and moving and all those things. And she's had a lot of wonderful special attention across the years. This is her at the Boston Children's Museum. And here is she is at Playland Adventures when it was over in Brewer. Now it's in Bangor. 
But when it was over in Brewer, she was absolutely insistent that she wanted to do a complete flip on this thing, shooting up into the air, bringing her knees up to her uh, under her chin and trying to flip backwards in this thing. She didn't succeed, but she came very, very close. And she's just a happy child. She loves life. Here's her looking a little bit more serious. We're up at the Samoset Resort, Samoset Four Seasons, up in Rangeley uh, Lakes. And she's there with her cousins. She's the one on the left with a like a scarf around her. And this is her going down the street in Stratham, New Hampshire on her bike with her sister on her right hand side. And the Boy Scouts in Stratham, New Hampshire have this incredible program called Lights for Lives. Pretty much all the community knows who Gloria is. She's well known in that area. She's a very social child. And this is a program where they, whereby they raise a lot of money with a competition that they have with houses being all decorated. And so this, the Life for Lives, about three years ago, was in honor of Gloria. And they raised sufficient money for the, the family to be able to put in a lot of handicapped equipment and outfit the house so that Gloria would have handholds and the right kind of uh, bathroom facilities and outdoor facilities for her so that she could do everything that other people do. And this is me with my granddaughter. Um, and, uh, and this is also me with my granddaughter. And I have another granddaughter in the other arm. But you can see her on the right-hand side uh, of, of my body. Uh, being able to hold her, we took her to an aquarium. And she was having a great old time this day getting wet, holding on to starfish and sea anemones. And those, probably not sea anemones, starfish and um, sea urchins and those sort of things. Um, she had just gotten done playing in the wet. We really can't imagine our lives without Gloria. We can't. She's a, a precious part of our family. So if you think about the chain of events that happened, because in 1937, 16-year-old Naomi said no, and how this world would be different had she given in and gotten that abortion, it's a lot of food for thought. So this is a live choice. This is a, a momentous choice that we're talking about when we're talking about abortion. Okay, so if we're dealing with utilitarianism and deontology and virtue ethics, which one of the theories do you think can most readily defend the choice to abort? I think it's pretty obvious that it's, it's most likely utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number, and the reasoning that we would use in that sort of a, a fashion, whether we're talking about pleasure or happiness, utilitarianism can most readily defend abortion. So over against that, which one would have the most difficulty defending the choice to have an abortion? And some might say it's a toss-up between virtue and deontology, but I think that deontology would have the harder time because deontology sees human life due to the second form of the categorical imperative as being intrinsically valuable. And so we are always to treat humanity, whether in the person of ourself or in the person of another, as an end in itself and never as a means only. That's the theory that would have the hardest time justifying abortion. This is a kind of an interesting thing. I'm, I bring this up in order to address the um, the dividedness of our society, the fact that we've almost on, on the edge of a civil war in our society of, of an ideological sort, not of a, a physical sort, over this issue. This is the hottest ethical dilemma in the United States at this time. So back in 1992, in a, a ruling with regard to abortion, Justice Anthony Kennedy said this. It's kind of an interesting statement. He's saying it in a set, from a secular standpoint. In a secular society, in the public realm, although we recognize that there are religions, we don't um, bring religion into the, these issues. This is the, um, the issue of the separation of church and state. So he says these matters, matters having to do with reproductive rights, with abortion, involving the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime, choices central to personal dignity and autonomy. Hit the pause button there. Autonomy literally means self-law my ability to make the choices and make the, to govern myself, to decide for myself. These matters involving the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in, in a lifetime, choices central to personal dignity and autonomy, are central to the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. At the heart of liberty, he says, is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of life, which is a very interesting statement. That's a kind of an odd statement that I, I will define what this is all about. So notice that the statement doesn't say that we're free to discover truth for ourselves, but to define and create it. So apparently, the highest court in the land now assumes that there is no truth to be found in the universe that we could agree upon anyway, 
and it assumes the right of all Americans is to define or invent their own realities. Now, whatever you think of that, how does that understanding stack up against religious understandings? When we're dealing with religions, and many Americans are religious, especially when we're dealing with the religions of the book, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, human life is seen as intrinsically valuable, and in their scriptures, in their writings, the baby developing in utero is spoken of as being a human being, being formed by the Creator, by the Maker. Okay, so if we have these two points of view in one culture, can you see why there would be people with very divided and different understandings about this issue within that one culture? People who feel very strongly one way or the other. One group is emphasizing autonomy, the word that was used by Judge Kennedy in that statement, and the other one is emphasizing the sanctity of life. For both of them, that value that they are defending is the primary value of importance to them. Okay. So if you think about that, what conflicts might result or flow from the existence of these two different streams of thought in one culture? Well, we can see it. We can see it all around us. We see it in the media. It is this incredible clash between these two points of view. I'm going to close with just some actual reasons for having an abortion. Lawrence Feiner, you can see it's et al. So there's other authors together with him. But Feiner is probably the best known researcher in this area. Reasons U.S. Women Have Abortions, Quantitative and Qualitative Perspectives, this is called. So 25% say, I'm not ready for a, another child right now. The timing is wrong for me. 23% say, I can't afford a baby now. 19% say, I have completed my childbearing years. I have other people depending on me. My children are grown. Those sorts of concerns. 8% say, I don't want to be a single mom. I'm having relationship problems. I don't think this is a good situation to bring a baby into. 7% say, I don't feel like I'm old enough. I don't feel mature enough to raise another child. I feel like I'm too young. This is too big an undertaking for me. Going on from there, 6% are in the other category and they give no further explanation. 4% say this would interfere with my education or my career plans. That is a tricky thing to try to juggle these things. 4% say physical problems with my own health are the issue. We have a daughter who has both times that she's been pregnant, she's had heart problems. The doctor told her if she gets pregnant again, she could die. And so, physical problems with my health. 3% say possible problems affecting the health of the developing fetus. But this is what I'm concerned about. Going on, then we get into the half percent or less than half percent. Less than half percent say my husband or partner wants me to have an abortion. Less than half percent say my parents want me to have an abortion. Less than a half percent say I don't want people to know I had sex or got pregnant. Less than a half percent say I was a victim of rape. And that's the end of it. But that gives you an idea of the reasons, the things that motivate people when they're trying to decide upon this weighty and live choice.